Charles Betcher. He lived from 1852 to 1948. I was one when he died. <laughs> um, he was a very successful Colorado businessman. One of those wealthy guys that had their fingers in lots of different pies. He was into livestock, uh, cement, potash, steel, hardware, uh, securities, utilities, sugar, of course, and transportation. He came from Germany at the age of 17 with his family. And he worked with his older brother, Herman, in Wyoming. I'm not sure what they did, but I got a feeling it was cowboying. They came to Colorado, uh, and he pursued various business projects there. And he was often partnered with John F. Campion. Uh, Campion, you know, is that unincorporated town, kind of, uh, south of Loveland. And I think it's in Loveland's city limits now. He, Betcher was one of the founders of the Ideal Cement Company. He was instrumental in starting the U.S. sugar beet industry and he importing, importing a system of growing and harvesting from Germany's successful agricultural communities. His family fortune has funded and is still funding many philanthropic enterprises in Colorado. And his family's mansion, I bet you most of you know, in Denver was gifted to the state by the Betcher Foundation in 1959 as the Colorado governor's residence, better known as the governor's mansion. Okay. Sugar beets were also grown in the upper Midwest of the United States and in the Great Plains and the far West, as well as in Europe. That's where the crop was first uh, introduced. The sugar beet was grown as a garden vegetable and for livestock fodder long before it was valued for its sugar content. Uh, sugar was produced experimentally from beets in Germany in 1747. That's pretty darn early. Uh, by a chemist named Andreas Margraf. You can see how his name is spelled. It's kind of strange, but it's German. Uh, but the first sugar beet factory was built in Europe in 1802 in Silesia, which is now in Poland. Meg pointed out, he has lamb chops and we have lambs on the same side. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the fodder was meant, the beets and the tops were meant for livestock fodder and it was very nutritious for them. Okay. Now, this slide is courtesy of Meg Dunn. Appreciate it, Meg. Uh, there were three smaller factories that were built previously to Loveland's factory. That was in Grand Junction in 19, or 1899, and um, Rocky Ford in 1900, and Sugar City in 1900. Those are down southeast uh, part of the state. The Colorado Agricultural College's research showed that growing sugar beets actually helped enhance the soil and that the crop would thrive in northeastern Colorado. And the college was renamed Colorado State College of Agriculture and Mechanics in 1935 and renamed again in 1957 to Colorado State University. So beet sugar was less expensive than cane sugar, mostly because of the shipping that had to be done in cane sugar. And immediately, as soon as the crop took hold, sugar beets up here, uh, the sugar beet sugar became much more abundant than cane sugar. So it was also less expensive there. So I'll let you read this slide for just a second. Um, 1920 was the last sugar beet factory built that was in Fort Lupton. And, we'll, and all of these are gone except one, which we'll talk about in just a minute. There were six independent sugar factories in Northern Colorado, all built around the turn of the 20th century. And they consolidated to form the Great Western Sugar Company in 1905. The Kastaputa River and the South Platte River and good soil made Northeastern Colorado perfect for growing sugar beets. I questioned that about good soil because as a gardener, I think it's awful soil we have in Northern Colorado, lots of clay. 
but the beets must have loved it. Uh, so Betcher uh, and J.J. Brown, Miss Margaret Brown or Molly Brown's husband, and John F. Campion, again, were the wealthy partners who founded Great Western Sugar Company, and it was a co-op owned by the local farmers. So I'll let you look at the slide here. Loveland's Great Western Sugar Factory, starting up here at the left, counterclockwise. It was going up there in that picture, 1901. You can see the office building is built there. It was, uh, it's facing Madison Road, if any of you want to come see where I'm talking about. Uh, and then down on the bottom right is the 1930s, where the beef duck ramp is already built. And then the upper right is about 1960. And I think that's right because the silos were erected in 1957. And you can see that beautiful little steam engine puffing along right there on the north side of the factory. Okay. Um. <clears throat> By 1930, Great Western was composed of 20 factories in Colorado, Nebraska, Montana, and Wyoming. The beet industry, did someone have a question? No? The beet industry diversified Colorado's economy that had been reliant on mining and ranching. Not much diversity there. And Colorado, as you mostly know, has had many booms and busts. Uh, for many decades, the sugar beet industry was very important to the economy of Northern Colorado. Great Western became the national leader in beet sugar production by the 1940s. <clears throat> Excuse me. Apart from sugar beet production, the company also undertook agricultural research into sugar beet practices during much of its history. However, new laws caused a downturn in the 1950s, which hurt the beet industry badly and boosted the sugarcane industry. That sounds political. The company was sold in 1967, again in 1974, and again in 1985, when sugar beet growers from Colorado, Nebraska, Montana, and Wyoming formed the Western Sugar Cooperative. Okay, um, Grand Junction was the first one to close. It's on the next slide. I kind of got those pictures mixed up a little bit. It closed in 1929. Fort Collins was the first of Northern Colorado's sugar beet factories to close, and that was in 1954. Greeley closed uh, in 2002, so it was open for exactly 100 years. And Loveland closed in 1985. And it was still kind of operating, but not making uh, processing sugar beets. It was just for storage of sugar. And they're still storing sugar in those big white silos. Uh, Fort Morgan is the only operating sugar factory in Northern Colorado today. So we'll look at a couple others. So here we got Grand Junction, Fort Collins, Windsor, and I can't see this one. Oops. Longmont. Next. Which one was it? Longmont. Long yeah. Um, oh, Longmont. Yeah. So the next slide is um, Fort Morgan that's still running and Greeley that closed most recently. All righty. Both growing and processing. Oh, here's the loved ones again. Now this is um, 1901. This building down here on the bottom right of that black and white picture is gone. And you can see the silos are not there. There's a big water tower up there that's gone now. But the little office building is still there and you can see the beat ramp. Uh, right now, this this building that's down on the bottom right that's gone is where the road is that leads into the backside of Home Depot. And I think these buildings over here on this side 
on the left are gone too. The sugar factory had many physical changes over the decades. So this is a good picture on the bottom right, this color picture. It's the only one I can find um, that looks so beautiful. Big shed there, but I think that's gone now. This is from looking from the southwest corner. The water tower is still there in that one. Sharon, 79. So, Sharon, if that's from the southwest corner, then would that be near where the depots are? Yeah. Might have been taken from the depots. So that but it looks a little further east than the depots. So that field where the corn is growing might be the field that the police department owns. Might be, yeah, yeah. I have another picture somewhere that's come out that has some sugar beet um, shacks, the German beet shacks, right there. So we'll look for that. Okay, both growing and processing requires a large amount of water. Uh, which during the first few years kept the numbers of beets grown down to a low number. Great Western cobbled its water supply together from a variety of different sources, some legal, some say not legal, but they did it, so must have been okay. By 1910, it was estimated that the Lovin factory processed 70,000 tons of beet sugar and used nearly 5 million gallons of water a week as the beets moved through a complex series of pipes, valves, flumes, tanks, and machines. So this is a sketch of the interior of a beet factory. I'm not sure which one it is of, but they were all very similar on the interior. Same processes, anyway. The factory sent, whoops, wait a minute. Boy, must have rolled the mouse, sorry. The factory sent affluent water, or the water they had used, through ditches to settling tanks so the water could be reused. And they did reuse all the water they could. I'm not sure they were so um earth-minded it's just so they didn't run out of water because there wasn't that much available this is before the colorado big thompson water project was brought over in the late 40s so in loveland our settling ponds were located southeast of town just south of east first street where it curves north into county road nine which is now boise i mean boyd lake road big curve there so the if you're on that curve look don't look over the railing south and you can see the land where the settling ponds were okay the fort collins factory was situated on the cashapooter river on um, northeast of town uh, on its north bank there was an affluent flume that was constructed over the river in 1926 and here's a picture of that the flume drew massive amounts of water from the Kashapu River and deposited huge volumes of effluent into nearby ponds across the river. But first, before that, when they just did, the sugar factory deposited their effluent water just on the ground on the north side of the river, which was right up against the three colonies that they had built for their workers. Um, Andersonville, Let's see. Meg, what was the other two? Well, it was mostly Andersonville and Buckingham at the time, and the, the ponds were right near the neighborhoods. Yeah, how awful, and the smell must have been whew, bad. I've always heard people complain about the smell if they lived anywhere near the factory when it was in campaign process. Okay. Uh, Fort Collins did get a sewer system, Hap was telling us, in 1895 which is much earlier than Loveland's. It didn't get it to the late 1920s. And it really wasn't a sewer then, it, a sewer plant, it was just a filter. And then it went right back into the river. Everybody's sewer. 
Meg says, I'd hate to have been in Kansas. Yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, this allowed the factory to reuse its water, taking less from the river and cleaning the discharge a little bit at least before it went back into the river. And you'll see in, in, when we get further into the slideshow that lime is used um, in the processing of these sugar beets. And that's what killed all the grasses. Um, <clears throat> Meg was telling me that on the south side of the river now, because the slume took everything over to the south side and deposited in the fields, uh, that those grasses 60 years later are just now starting to grow again. So it was yeah. the lime that killed everything. Let me jump in on that. So if, yeah. if you're walking along the Pooter Trail or biking along the Pooter Trail, there's a sign for this bridge that you can stop and read, and the bridge is right there across the river. But if you turn and face the opposite direction, you can see where there, they had a, um, I don't know what it's called, where you release the water and then you put it, you block it again. And that all of that, the, the plants completely changed. All of the native plants died and new plants came in that could handle the lime. And it's only now that the native plants are moving back in. And uh, another area that where you can see some of this land is on the Nix farm. It's, I believe, the natural area's offices, but it's all it's also an open um, open area that you can walk around in, and it's connected right to the Pooter Trail. So it's well worth, if you're ever down in that area, checking out the bridge and just seeing the change to the landscape there. Okay, great. Thanks. I'll do that. Okay, um, although most of Fort Collins factory complex was demolished in the 19, during the 1960s after the plant was closed, the effluent flume and the bridge, they call it a bridge, it says because it bridged the river, but it was a sewer, it wasn't ever for traffic. Uh, they remain over the river. And they are on the National Register of Historic Places, and that was happened in 19, uh, 2014. Okay. Sugar beets began to begin to metabolize their own sugar as soon as they are pulled from the ground. So it's important to get them to the factory right away. The Great Western Railway was built in 1902, uh, and that's a year after the Loveland sugar factory was built. And that was for transporting beets to factory and bringing in lime and coal. In 1917, it added passenger service out to the Eastern towns using a standard gauge track. Its first two coal burning steam engines were numbers one and two, of course. There were several larger engines added later to the retinue. These, these are the large ones. I think this is, I can't read the numbers on the front, but over here on the middle, on the right, it says uh, 75. And I think this is 75 on the left as well. It looks like her. She looks a lot better on the right picture, more modern. Probably been refurbished there. Okay. Harvesting and processing beets is conducted from the end of October to March, and it's called a campaign. The first year of Loveland's factory, Loveland Factory's operation, the farmers used wagons, and soon they made side dump wagons. They were pretty inventive, these farmers, always, of course. Uh, this was pretty inefficient. Can you imagine how many, uh, the sugar beets huge. If you look at this slide closely enough, you can almost tell how big they are. Um, a sugar beet grower that's in Bertha today said he's seen some as big as 17 pounds a piece. And the sugar beet tops are big. They stand up from the ground about 24, 26 inches. And sometimes the beet is about half that size under the ground. Sometimes it's bigger. But a, a normal beet would, on average, would probably weigh six or seven pounds a piece. So half to five pound bag of sugar in one hand, and you know it's got to be heavier than that. 
the first year of Loveland's factory's operation, farmers used wagons, so I said that. Uh, this was pretty inefficient, and it was really the very next season by the advent of the railway. The beat dumps were established at many points on, along the railway, usually named for the farmer who owned that particular piece of land. No one factory owned any of the beat dumps, even if they were nearest it. They were shared by all factories. If one factory was ahead of another uh, in, in processing, beets from anywhere could be shipped to that plant with the smallest pile of unprocessed beets. So they tried to keep the piles at every factory even as best they could. This beet dump is in Burton. Uh, the tracks are running north. We're looking west. You can see the mountains back there. And that house back there, not the first one with the little um, pyramid roof, but the other one, is now blue and it's got modern siding on it and it's been there for years. It's pretty little house. But you can see the farmers are using a side dump wagon into the train cars. And it's still kind of inefficient to bring wagons, but how else would you get it to the railroad? Anyhow, these are pretty close. Beat dumps were built. There were, I don't know how many of the beat dumps there were, but there were lots so that they were close. Okay. This is just one little section, courtesy Ken Jessen, of the map that Sugar Beets Factory in Loveland uh, contracted with each farmer during the year to grow however many beets and however many acres he had so they could make a count of what was going to come at the harvest. And I'd love to stand and look at this. It is a huge wall of map. Uh, this is about life size if you're standing there in person looking at it. And you can see lots of names that you've either read about or know or have heard about somehow. It's really cool, I thought. This is a beet dump near Fort Collins. I like it even better than the Bertha um, beet dump picture because this one is a little, a little later in time and it shows more. It's got the, shows the engine coming in with the carloads of uh, gondolas or beets there behind it. The ramp of the horses coming up. I thought that was an interesting shot. Those horses had to be pretty good. There's one shot I kind of wonder if the horse, maybe that was his first time up there because he sure looked nervous. These guys look like they're all had at it. Okay. Hey, now it won't go forward. What's the matter now? Huh. Usually, if you just click on the picture and then use your arrows, it should work. There you go. Okay, I just used the mouse. On the left is a Giddings sugar beet puller. You can't see all the horses, but he's got four horses hooked to that thing, which means it needs at least four horsepower to pull the beets up. And he really didn't pull them up. The two knives that are sticking up there between him and the horses. They just go down on the ground and kind of slice, slice, slice um, to get the ground loose around the beets. And then the, somebody has to come along and actually physically pull them out of the ground and chop the tops off. And then they save the tops for fodder and the beets go into the wagons. So um, let's see. And then the next picture on this slide is the beet piler, very inventive name. And it's at the Loveland factory in 1945. There was a new industry, so there had to be new equipment. Look at the spiral slide going down here to run off this conveyor belt. And into this, no, I guess the conveyor belt goes to the top of the pile and they just fall down. I'm not sure what the, slide does. But look at that beautiful old truck. Now this thing, this big piler is on wheels. 
but it must have been heavy and hard to move. I wonder what moved it. It'd be a pretty good size. Okay, here are some field workers, migrants, and immigrants. Um, the Germans from Russia were the first people to come. They were invited. Um, I don't know if everybody knows the story of Germans from Russia, but back in the early 1800s, um, the Russian Tsarina was a cap was Catherine the Great, and she was a, a German princess who married the Tsar Alexander, and then he died. <coughs> she became Tsarina, the first woman. And uh, her ways were a little different than the Russians, and she was not exactly popular with everybody. She invited her people, because they were so industrious, to come over to the Volga River Valley and make it green, grow something. They wanted to keep their own language, their own customs, their own schools, their own culture, everything. And she said, fine, keep it, just make it green. So I don't know what all they grew, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was sugar beets. Um, so later on, um, some czars decided this couldn't be, couldn't be right, that the Germans had to uh, join the army and some other things that they were fighting against. So they were persecuted. And that was about the 1840s. My ancestor that first came over on my dad's side was a German from the Volga region of Russia. But he came in 1803 when there was no persecution. So I can, can't figure out why he came unless he wasn't you know, the first son. The first son got everything and seconds and thirds got no, nothing. So maybe that's why he came over. Uh, let's see, so Fort Collins had uh, three colonies that we were talking about that the sugar beet factory invited the people to come up and stay. Don't just be migrant workers and leave when it's gone. We can use you in the fields. Uh, we can use you in the, many of you in the factories when the fields are done. So um, the Germans from Russia were the first. They built many houses right near the factory on the north side of the river. And then the Hispanic camp moved into a lot of those houses. Some of them built their own. And then later on, a few Japanese came. And so there are three colonies uh, in Fort Collins and there's a museum, Museo de los Tres Colonias. As you can see, it's mostly the Hispanics who run that museum, but they do talk about some of the others. Okay, let's go on. Whoops, backwards. Topping beans. These are seven children aged seven to 11. The paper says it was an exceptional group. Now you can see these are Germans from Russia kids. A lot of times they were standing up, but they had to pull the beets from the ground. These little kids, they must've got their muscles pretty quick. A great big meat knife, you can see it up here on the right with the hook. Hook that meat with, with, with the hook, grab it by the top by the greenery, put it against your leg, and chop the tops of it off pretty close to the top of the beet without getting your leg open. I bet some legs got some stitches on it. You can see the picture on the bottom right. That's exactly what she's doing. Boy, and they worked hard, those kids. The Germans from Russia were so thrifty and so um, hardworking that many of them saved and bought their own land and grew beets for the sugar factory instead of just working for somebody else. Let's see. So this is a beet shanty. You really can't see much of the building, but with a family standing in front of it. Um, these are Germans from Russia, from the Volga region. 
You can see they've all got blonde hair. <laughs> and this is the shanty on the right. This is in Windsor. <clears throat> they all built in the same way. They look like railroad box cars. The ropes were a little bit uh, rounded. Not sure how they did that. But it was all one of them. And sometimes 10 people would live there. Sharon, you got a little muted there. Could you say that part again? Oh, sometimes 10 people would live in a shack. Okay, now here's a here's a process chart <coughs> that Ken Jessen gave me. And when I gave this to Lemon, he got up and explained the chart, which I can't do. So you just have to look at it and see if you can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. You know they used a lot of water and a lot of lime, and then they bubbled um, carbonation into it. Is what I gather, and it took the impurities and the lime out of it. Okay. Anybody any questions or any, can anybody explain this chart any better than I did? Okay. Let's go on. Here's some pictures of, I think love, uh, I think they're all Lovelands because I'm a Lovelander, you know, so that's just the way I worked it up. <laughs> this little guy on the top left is called a dinky. Boy, he looks kind of beat up, doesn't he? He's just a little steam engine, hardly a boiler on wheels with a little bitty cab. And they're the ones that did all the switching in the yards. And on the right is the double water spout tower. I so wish they had left that. That would be so cool if it was still standing there. You don't see a double spouted tower very often. And on the bottom left, they were unloading beets into the wet hoppers. Like I said, um, it takes a lot of water to process sugar beets as well as throw them. Well, the wet hoppers are just a, a, a ditch or a flume that pushes the beets into the factory floating in water. Had to get the dirt off of them. And over here on the right, is one of our beautiful steam engines. Second, I'm trying to you you froze up for me for a minute there, Sharon. I froze up. Yeah, maybe just. Am I okay now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is our beautiful seventy-five again, pulling beats to Loveland. And as you know, I'm in, in love. As you can tell by now, I'm in love with steam engines. Okay. This is the, the depot I was talking about. The south facade and the west that faces Monroe is the first picture on the top left. The top right is looking west down the tracks. The sugar beet factory is behind the camera and the two depots there are on the left. You can see how close they are to the tracks. The short track company, Omnitrax, is the name of the company that owns the railroad company now. They said they'll give it to us, to the Historical Society of Loveland, or to anybody, if they'll just move it away from the tracks. Because even if we put offered to put up a great big um, wrought iron fence between the building and the tracks, and they said, no, it's still too close. We don't want people that close. And I can see their point in a way. If a train ever derailed right there, the car would just flop over onto the depot and crush it. Every little town I've ever had any communications with about the depots, any of them that saved them, like Westminster and Arvada, they were all too close to the tracks for modern day codes and they had to be moved. So if we save this one, um, now this is the north side and the east side. So the south side you can see is back there where that car is. Just just past the car is the county line and the Western Sugar property line. 
So just south of that is city land. And then there's a little street that comes into it off of Monroe. And on that street, on the south side, is the police and courts building, the new one. I mean, it's been there about 10 years, but maybe longer. But all that land belongs to the city, and we're hoping they will let us move it onto that land and be saved. We haven't asked the city council yet, uh, but we're going to. That's one of the next steps. As soon as we can show that we have enough support and we've started, we've got a good start on the fundraising, which is coming up pretty quickly, I think. So here is the um, north side on the bottom left of both the depots. The one on the left is a little freight depot, and that was built in 1942. Uh, and you can see it's up on a stilted platform. And it's called an LCL, which in railroad, railroad lingo is funny. It's less than a car load. It, it's too small to hold a complete whole boxcar of freight. So it's less than a car load. So it's an LCL freight depot. And the freight depot is on the right. The entrance door is on the south side. You're looking at the, at the, uh, I'm not sure what his title is. The guy that sits in the bay window, and there's windows on both sides, east and west. And remember, we're looking at the north facade. He watches the tracks as they're coming. You can see the window on the west side in this next picture on the bottom right. <coughs> OK. In 1985, um, excursions, passenger excursions were revived. And there's, I think it's 75, yeah, I'm sure she is, sitting in front of the depot with a, uh, looks like two cabooses, or maybe three cabooses hooked to it. They didn't have any passenger cars anymore. <coughs> Excuse me, there was one passenger car but it was a combination car and it is now parked at the Great Western or the Colorado Railroad Museum in Golden. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. But by the, by the 1980s, all they had was engines and cabooses. So that's what was used. I took my kids one time and, and rode it. It just went out east. This one's facing west though, so I'm not sure where he was going. Okay, and on the right, there's a map of the Great Western Railway. And you can see on that map a lot of the beat dumps with strange names. Bunyan, um, Pulliam, Buddha, and Welty. Adna, Elm. I don't know if that was after an elm tree or after a farmer named Elm. Bruce. Uh, but like I said, most of them were on somebody's land and <clears throat> named after the owner of the land. Oops. Okay. Here's two more pictures of dinkies. The bottom left is in a field. I don't even think he's on a track. And he sure is beat up. The top left, He's working, looks a little bit better condition. I'm not sure if he's in Loveland or not. Can't quite tell. And here on the top right is that combination car at the Golden Museum. And this is taken, uh, I took it in 2017. You can see it's really in bad shape, but it could be restored. And a combo car, you'll notice, between these two sets of windows, there's a boarded up window. Well, this was a mail car and a passenger car. And a combination car is usually two uses in, in one car. Sometimes it was three. I've seen them at the B&O Railroad in, uh, Museum in Baltimore. It has one that's got three uses. So it was freight and mail and passengers. <clears throat> and on the bottom right 
here is the Great Western Railway caboose. And it is now over at the um, Great Colorado Model Railroad Museum. It's all restored and it's indoors. If you haven't been over there, everybody should go see the Colorado Railroad Museum. It will blow you away. It's fabulous. And this picture in the middle of these two guys on this rail inspection car, I don't know where it was taken, but it's so unusual. I don't know if we had one or not, or if there was one even in this northeastern Colorado anywhere. But they reminded me of the Stanley brothers in their car. <coughs> and I thought it was pretty cute to put in there. Okay. Let's go on. These are dandy dancers, sometimes called section hands in English. They had other names too. Some of them you probably shouldn't use. And they're the ones that work the tracks, fixed the tracks, laid the tracks. And on the right is a picture of Lovin's factory with those beet shanties, the German shanties in that field where the corn was. And on the bottom left, Great Western engine number 60 pulls the combo car and a couple other, a caboose and a gondola. And this was in 1955. Okay. So here's the ruins on the bottom left of the Loveland Sugar Factory. That's the biggest building. Just to the left is the office building and it is still standing. <coughs> Excuse me. The story of about it was sugar, stupid seeing it on the roof. When the when the factory sold and closed for the last time in 1985, it was bought by Amalgamated Sugar, or White Sugar is their brand. And they just, like I say, used the, the silos for storage. Um, but Fort Morgan is the only one that's processing beets now. And they started tearing down the buildings, just knocking out the walls. And it was so that they could pull the equipment out and salvage the equipment. There are factories still running in the Montana, uh, I think in Wyoming and probably Nebraska. I'm not sure where else, but maybe they sold some of the equipment. I don't know, but they didn't really, they weren't interested in knocking down the whole building. They were just getting the equipment out. So the ruins are still standing there, half up and half down, just like they, that looks now. And the police, somebody, somebody thought and sicked the police on the caretaker that was living there. I think he lives in the office building. Um, that they thought he was cooking methamphetamine. So they came in and they found this white substance, and they took it in to be tested, and he was. High rate, as you can imagine, because it wasn't methamphetamine, it was sugar. It was sugar, stupid. So he got up and wrote that on the roof after that. It's been there ever since. Uh, this is the north side of the factory we're looking at, off the road that goes into the Home Depot. And then on the right, the two pictures of the molasses tank implosion in 1989. It it was scary at the time. And it imploded, not exploded, as you can see by the looking at the tank. And it was just gooey, awful mess, and it stank terribly. And nobody knew what it was. The police and fire came with their hazmat suits and everything, all this gear on. And the neighborhood was evacuated. <laughs> Turned out to be molasses left over from the sugar factory. It was a mess. Now the tank is gone, and in fact, this building on the right is gone. Just about everything's gone. The city leases that area, which is the southeast part of the factory property, right against Monroe. So, Sharon, um, I have a question. Yeah. So the factory closed in '85. You said. Yes. 
So they had just left the molasses behind instead of doing something with it? I guess so. Maybe um, Amalgamated Sugar was supposed to do something with it, but nobody did. I don't know for sure. <clears throat> but it was just left. Yeah, nobody knew what it was. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And this is the picture of what's left of it from Highway 30. No, from Monroe. Right? No. From that road, Home Depot's on the right. So we're looking almost, we're looking west, southwest. Just the sunset was pretty. There's a guy on Facebook who is crazy about those sugar silos. I'm not on Facebook very often anymore because I really don't like it, but um, he's on there all the time. He's always putting up new pictures of the silos. <laughs> you can, if you look at the top, the square part of the, of the buildings in silos, they used to have GW on it. Lots of old pictures have GW on it. Well, they took it down since when they when they bought it from GW, and so it was gone. Sharon, what's that tower on the left? It looks like a, a smokestack of some sort. I'm not sure what it did. Hmm. It's not a silo. Okay. So we have a um, an option on Facebook. We've had several of them, and there's one right now that's about to be finished. I'm not sure what the date is. These are some of the items that you can purchase. These all support the depot. We're hoping to raise, we think, about 86,000. We have so far raised about 20,000 and spent about 10. So we've got about 10 left, uh, but we're going well. In fact, Betcher Foundation has just said they're going to help us. So that is wonderful. I don't know what they'll give us, but um, I mean, I think I do know that since they haven't given us the, their official press release, I really can't say. But this on the top right is a painting that an artist has done on one of our transformers, and it is located at First and Boise. And so there's a, this is a print of her artwork. And I think they just wrapped it around the transformer. I just think it's wonderful. Looks like it was watercolor. And on the left is uh, some mugs. We now have glasses for sale too, beer glasses. Um, and this on the bottom is a painting. Done by an 81 year old woman from Loveland who donated it to us after she painted it so we could get some benefit out of it. Bless her heart. <laughs> okay. There's the south side of the people. I don't know what that 950 K Avenue is. A railroad company put that up. And this is not K Avenue. But the camera is on. It's on the road. We're looking east. You can see the silos back there. So this is the south facade and part of the west facade. Uh, the windows were boarded up in 85. That was so they wouldn't be vandalized and people get in there and we just painted windows on it just to make it look nicer, which was a nice deal. You can see it really needs a new roof really bad. This corner of the roof has been um, damaged. A truck hit it, but it's been examined and it is not causing water leakage inside. Those are big wide eaves and it's not getting inside. So that's good. But the foundation was just sandstone and it's pretty well melted into the ground. So the bottom of the building is sitting on the ground. So the architect that came and looked at it suggested that finish cutting the floor off, cut floor off, and pick it up with a crane and move it south 70 to 100 feet, wherever we're going to get a foot, onto a new foundation. So that's what we're saving for now. We spent money on 
uh, building assessment, can they be built without falling apart? And that's when he found that out that the foundations melted. Um, we'd had to spend another, some more money on hazardous material assessment. Yes, there's asbestos and lead paint everywhere. That needs to be abated before they can be moved. Uh, we can get a grant if we don't move it very far. We need to keep it in the complex of a sugar factory. Well, if you go, you can see that if you go 70 to 80 or 100 feet south, you can still see the sugar factory from it. It's still right there. And in fact, it's on what used to be sugar factory property. Um, so yeah, we're getting ready to move them and I think we're getting there. But we need some more help. Anybody can help us. If you'd like to send your check with the memo in the check to save the depots to Loveland Historical Society, PO Box 7311, Loveland, Colorado 80537. Or you can donate on our website, lovelandhistorical.org or on our Facebook page. And you can also see our auction there on the, in the Facebook page. Yeah. Okay. Are there any questions that anybody would like to ask? Sharon, this is Jenny Peabody. Hi, Jenny. I, hi. Happy New Year, everybody. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Happy New um, Year to so, you. Thank you. So we're going to have another place to be a docent. Well, we don't know what we're going to do with it. It might be a coffee shop with, with pictures on the walls or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, museums don't make money. Museums usually cost money. And so we don't mm -hmm. want to ask Loveland to take another museum and be spending money on it every year because they'll say no. The, oh, city council, the city council would. So uh, we don't know what we're going to do with it, but saving it's the first thing, restoring yeah. it's the second thing, and then deciding what's going to do with it later. But Loveland Housing Authority is going to build some low-income house, housing just east of it on the rest of that land. Oh. So I think they're going to be happy to see this land get um, developed. Mm-hmm. And the depot on the as an anchor, you know. Mm -hmm. So especially if it's a little retail shop or something. So I don't know if we'll be having docents, you know, that are volunteers, or yeah, we're actually going to have to have. It'll the Loveland Historical Society will be, and Historic Larimer County also who's helping us, will be in on the decisions on what to do with it. Uh huh. So everybody can be in on it. Good. Yeah. Thank you. So I just want to add on to what Sharon just said. If for those of you in Fort Collins, think about what they now call the butterfly building that used to be part of the Pooter uh, Creamery over on Laporte, right between Howes and Mason. And it's that building with the roof that kind of goes up like butterfly wings instead of instead of being pointy at the top, the point was at the bottom. And that's now being used as a coffee shop and bakery and that's, oh. that's a, a great reuse of a historic building and it gets people inside the historic building so they're seeing it they're connecting with it just like they would if it was a museum but how often do you visit a museum compared to how often you go out and get coffee so you might actually end up interacting with the building more and there's also a um, one of the fundraisers i'm also on this committee for these depots and one of the fundraisers that we held uh, was with the breweries and all of the, there are nine breweries in Loveland and we, you know, small local breweries and they made something called the Great Rail Pale Ale in honor of the depots and helped us raise money through that. And one of those um, breweries is just north of this part of Loveland. It's just north of the sugar factory. So yeah. it, it's conceivable that that could be one of their um, 
what do you call it where you go in a tasting room or something like that yeah so, so there's you know the sky's the limit in terms of what we'll do with the building but right now we're just focusing on getting it moved and another thing i'll add to what sharon was saying if we move it within the context of the sugar factory then we can get grants from historic or from history colorado which is oh thank you yeah that's i was going to that and i forgot it yeah, that's the, the, it's kind of like the State Historical Society. It's what it used to be called, and it's now History Colorado. So that will right. help. The other thing is, and I, I think I can say this out loud, stop me if I can't, Sharon, but we have heard from a city staff person who's involved in developing this plot of land for the city, and she mentioned that there is a there is a space in the plans that includes the depot. So even yes. if we don't have city council approval yet, so it's not all the way certain, but we do know that the staff at least is thinking about how are we going to integrate this building. So there's hope there. Yes, and the Loveland Historical Preservation Commission is also working with us, and they're kind of liaisons between the city manager and us. The city manager is for it, and so is the assistant city manager. They've been helping. Hey, Megan, Sharon, uh, yes. this is Brian. Uh, it's something that I had th thought would have been cool here in Fort Collins would have been to have a coffee shop opened up as a history stop over place so people could walk into the coffee shop, sit down at a table and talk any history topic they wanted. Oh, and, wonderful. And the depot seems like a, a great, uh, uh, the theme could be a, uh, where history lovers Con you know collect or congregate and it would help in a grant with the history you know with colorado history if the if it was going to be allowing people to just come in and share their stories about the loveland fort collins greeley and the, you know the whole area oh yeah right yeah um we had a fundraiser downtown uh, with a booth and uh the day it was october 23rd when the great real ale was um, premiered. What's the word? Tapped. Tapped. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I like to drink beer, but I'm not familiar with all the terms. Um, anyway, we had a a few people come and write their their stories about working for or their grandpa worked or for the the sugar factory or for the railway or something and. We're going to keep that going. We want to collect all these people's stories. So that was kind of fun. Hey, Sharon, this is oh. Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Hey, I wanted to share with everyone that those of you that are interested in this topic about the Great Western and Northern Colorado, one of the best books that I've found is Sugar Tramp. Oh, yeah. And I wrote it down in the comments that everyone can get the information. It's Sugar Tramp, Colorado's Great West Western Railway by Gary Morgan, written in 1975. There's some of the photos that you used in your presentation, a couple of the maps. Uh, it's, it's a really great book to, if you can get your hands on it. Yeah. And there's another one by uh, Candy. I can't think of her last name now. It's thick. It's huge. And it's it's all about the Great Western Sugar Company. It's gigantic, but it was, and it was for sale in the Lovell Museum, and I think it's gone. It was a limited edition. So if you find it on um, Amazon or somewhere. You might be able to grab one, but I guess that's really good. I never bought one because when they were new, they were eighty-five dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Ted added a link in the chat for the Sugar Tramp on Amazon. If anyone wants to just go to Amazon and order it from there. Oh, also, good. I was going to mention Sharon talked about that um, online auction, and apparently that ended December thirty-first. But you know what? Oh, like right. Not many things sold through the auction based on the numbers on the side of the screen. So I did put the link in the chat if you want to go to the auction. And if you can't, 
purchase anything through the auction, you can get a hold of me or Sharon or any of the Loveland Historical Society folks. And I betcha if we still have stuff, we'd be really happy to to sell you whatever we got. We got. We do uh, still have stuff. We have the beer glasses, the mugs, the prints that I showed you that were on the transformer. Um, the, one of the paintings, that one I showed you, there was one of the silos that did sell already. Um, what else? Can't think of anything else. The, the beer glasses are great. My husband saw them and he thought, oh, those are too small. They'll never work. And then he ended up opening up a can of beer and poured the whole thing in. It fit just fine. So they look small, but they're just petite and they still fit your beer. <laughs> they, have, they have the Great Western, um, Save the Great Western Sugar Depot's logo on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Sharon, there was one question in the chat just about what what happened to the sugar industry? Why did it seem to collapse like it did? Well, the first thing that I know of is, um, I said so in the slideshow, that new laws were passed that, that hurt the sugar beet industry and helped the cane sugar industry. So the competition was on again, and I said that it seemed kind of political to me. Mm -hmm. which it probably was well Sharon you also have to remember that uh, in 1950s um, we were dumping the the uh, water onto the ground or back into the river and it was a lot of water yeah. and uh, between foreign competition um, the regulations about what you could do with dumping toxic waste back in the river. How'd you like to be downstream in Greeley? Yeah. Um, and uh, a, a whole lot of things of uh, the labor intensity of growing sugar beets and harvesting sugar beets uh, made it less economically advantageous uh, compared yeah. to the foreign competition with uh, sugar cane. Right. Yeah, that's true. Sugar cane's not all shipped across the Caribbean. A lot was grown in the southern states like Louisiana. But still, that's the biggest problem that the beet industry had was the cane sugar competition. Also, am I on? Hi, Brad. Yes. Yeah, also, well, didn't like the Hunt brothers try to corner the sugar market and that kind of destroyed the industry as well. I, I, I don't know the whole story, but the Hunt, I don't brothers know out, either. the Hunt brothers out of Texas tried to corner the, the, the sugar market. And I think, I, I wish I knew the story, but somehow that destroyed the industry as well. That may be. I always knew there was some kind of under the table something going on, but I never knew what it was. I've done quite a bit of research on the uh, Russian Germans, and yeah. um, it's a fascinating story. The little colony there by the river, uh, when not sure, just shortly after they moved in, there was a flood, the flood that uh, uh, killed Strauss, um, 1903, I think. Um, 1904. 1904. Flooded that whole area. Um, they were amazing people to, you know, come through all of that. The, sh the sugar plant gave them a little piece of land and a pile of lumber when they first came and they built their own houses. Um, the little houses, a lot of them are still there. You can see when you uh, drive down, what is that, Linden, Lincoln. Um, another kind of interesting thing is originally sugar beets uh, had a lot of sprouts. And so the, they had to go through and manually cut those sprouts off as they were growing. And CSU was instrumental in developing a hybrid that uh, didn't have the sprouts on it. And that uh, helped make uh, sugar beet growing a lot more efficient. Thanks, Randy and Brad. That was good info. Well, thank you so much, Sharon, for be being willing to give your presentation to us today. We really appreciate it.